Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this joint ICAS RSM webinar. The webinar is an opportunity to find out more and ask questions about what's new in charity financial reporting, um, and also about how charities' experience of being audited may have changed recently. I'm Keith McPherson, uh, and I'll be guiding you through this webinar. Uh, I'm an audit partner at Henderson Logie, specialising in the charity and the wider not-for-profit sector. Um, and I'm also chair of the ICAS Charities Panel. So before we get into the start, um, you'll have seen a couple of slides about the ICAS uh, Foundation's fundraising campaign um, entitled Support Their Success, um, showing now. Um, and over the last 10 years, the foundation has helped more than 300 students and awarded more than £2.1 million in funding. Um, it's just launched its new 2023 to 2030 strategy, uh, and you can read more about that in the September 23 edition of the ICAS CA magazine. Every penny donated um, to the ICAS Foundation, either through the QR code um, or the text links on the screen, goes towards funding academically talented young people to study accountancy or finance at university uh, and encouraging them into a career in the accountancy profession through ICAS CA training. So um, in today's webinar, um, you'll hear from Kelly Adams, who will speak about uh, three main uh, aspects. Firstly, anticipated changes to FRS 102 and the charity SORP uh, arising from the FRC's re most recent periodic review of UK GAP uh, and the charity SORP development process. Secondly, about Oscar's duty to make trust, charity trustees reports and financial statements available to the public uh, under the new Scottish Charities Act. Uh, and finally, also about how recent key changes to auditing standards uh, are impacting on the work of charity auditors uh, like uh, ourselves and how charities can conduct a successful audit tendering exercise. Uh, so, as I say, I'm delighted to be joined this morning by uh, Kelly Adams. Um, Kelly leads um, RSM's public and third sector offering in Scotland. Um, she has over 20 years experience in providing audit and assurance services and advising and supporting not-for-profit organisations. Um, having originally trained and qualified um, with uh, RSM, as I say, over 20 years ago, um, and now looks after a wide portfolio of not-for-profit um, clients, um, providing insightful uh, and practical advice uh, across them. Um, she's also a member of the ICAST Charities Panel. So just before we get um, into the main detail, a couple of uh, housekeeping matters just to remind you of. Um, you can submit questions at any time through the live Q&A facility, which can be accessed on the right hand side of your screen. <clears throat> questions can be submitted uh, anonymously uh, or only to the presenters for the webinar if you wish, uh, and we won't identify who questions uh, come from. Um, you can also just join in the, the general conversation today through the discussion forum, um, also accessed on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and this forum allows you to comment on or discuss with your fellow delegates uh, on the webinar matters that are, are being raised and covered. Uh, we are, of course, recording this webinar and we'll make it available uh, for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it uh, or share it with others. Um, and the slides for the webinar will be found al alongside the on-demand video. Um, so both the recording and those associated documents will be available at icast.com forward slash webinars. Um, finally, no uh, need to be concerned about background no noise, wherever you are, um, as everyone, everyone on the webinar is automatically muted. So uh, we look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar. Um, and of course, we'll try and get to as many as possible. Um, but for now, um, we'll hand over to Kelly. That's great. Thank you very much for the, the introduction, uh, Keith, and good morning, everybody. A warm welcome uh, to, to this, this webinar. So I think it's safe to say that when we scheduled this webinar back in April, April May time, we did think there might have been a bit more progress with both uh, FRS 102 in terms of the, the, the FRED, the exposure draft, and also the charity SORP development process such that, that we might have some really concrete changes to report to you. 
Uh, as it stands, FRS 102 update and assault progress has been a bit slower than we might have hoped, but nonetheless, um, we do have lots to update you on. Uh, and we've set that out on the, the, the slide there in terms of the contents. Uh, and uh, with lots to get through, uh, I'll just move on to the, the first section uh, of the uh, webinar. So in terms of changes to UK GAP, the Financial Reporting Council is currently analysing the responses that it's received uh, from the consultation in relation to the pro pre proposed changes to UK GAAP. Uh, the aim of this is to reflect changes uh, to IFRS accounting standards uh, on accounting for contracts and customers and also leasing. And so this section of the webinar does explore the implications for charities from these two uh, key changes. So. Just a bit of background then, you hopefully are aware that the, the second periodic review of FRS 102 is, is well underway. Um, as I mentioned before, the consultation uh, closed, it closed actually uh, back in April, uh, and the FRC are going through all the responses that they have received um, to that, that consultation. It's worth noting that in developing the exposure draft, or the FRED, uh, as we call it, um, as well as uh, calling for um, notes in terms of the consultation um, from uh, those that participate in the charity sector, they do also consider uh, ISAB's proposed changes in developing uh, their um, IFRS for SMEs accounting standard, uh, and also other developments in corporate reporting. I guess it's fair to say that in general, requirements uh, you know, in the FRED have become more onerous, and there is a general feeling among those, those of us that are involved in the charity sector that FRS 102 might not necessarily be proportionate to the characteristics of small um, not-for-profit entities, in particular in relation to the disclosure requirements. There is a general feeling of inequity uh, between the reporting requirements for small uh, for-profit entities and uh, small not-for-profit entities, as you will see from the remainder of the, the, the section of this, of this webinar. But before we do that, uh, what are the planned timings uh, for the new FRS 102 and when will it be effective from? So uh, if you've seen the FRED, you will be aware that the proposed effective date was for periods commencing on or after 1st of January 2025. However, as we sit uh, today, we don't yet uh, have a, an FRS 102 uh, and we haven't have had any indications from the FRC uh, when we can expect that. So I therefore think that there is actually a real possibility uh, that the updated FRS 102 might not be seen until 2024. Uh, and I think this can be put down probably to the volume of comments that they have actually received on the consultation uh, and comments on the proposed commencement itself in terms of being able to implement uh, those, those, those proposed changes. So following the closure of the public consultation, the FRC did quickly recognise that uh, their the topic of lease accounting was definitely one uh, that needed further consideration for charities, for public benefit uh, entities. I think it's worth noting uh, before we move on that ICAS has been raising concerns um, about this with um, the FRC in particular in relation to their consultation uh, response uh, and in particular in relation to the fact that the FRC had decided not to introduce the single lease accounting model for micro entities on the grounds that it would be too onerous. Uh, so that effectively gives um, private entities, private companies, a concession that's not available to charities of the same size because charities can't apply um, FRS uh, 105. So this is one of the key areas that we do hope changes uh, in the, the, the FRS 102 when it, uh, when it comes out, just in terms of providing a similar concession to uh, public benefit entities from applying the lease accounting requirements, because as I say, they are expected to perhaps be uh, quite onerous for some charities. So just to be clear then, if the publication of FRS 102 does fall into uh, next year, 
then that commencement date of 1st of January 2025 won't be achievable because FRC's policy is that there does need to be a year in between the publication of a new standard and the effective date. Uh, so it's pretty much watch this space. We're hoping that there's some information comes out uh, imminently uh, in relation to the publication date. And I know that uh, ICAS do uh, have some meetings scheduled later this week. However, it just in terms of the timing, it wasn't. Uh, and, uh, it's just after the webinar. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't in place. So watch this space in terms of the timing. So in relation to the principal amendments, you uh, I've mentioned before, they are in relation to revenue recognition and also lease accounting, and we are going to consider those in detail uh, and, and on the next few slides. But And there are other proposed uh, improvements that I've noted on the slide there, but for the purposes of this session, I'm not going to go through those. Uh, we're just going to focus on, uh, on the key changes. So in terms of uh, leases, so the lease requirements are uh, set to change quite significantly. So the IFRS 16 single lease model uh, has been proposed, which requires lessees to recognise all leases on the balance sheet, uh, whether they are uh, characteristics of an operating or a finance lease, uh, and that is subject to some limited um, exemption. So what happens is you would recognise uh, what we call a right of use asset, on the balance sheet and a corresponding uh, lease liability. And it's the lease liability that forms the initial recognition uh, of the right of use asset. Uh, and it's measured at the present value of the lease payments. So this must be discounted uh, at the interest rate in implicit in lease, or if this isn't readily determinable, the incremental borrowing or lessees obtainable borrowing rate may be used as well. So there is a simplification uh, within the FRED uh, for public benefit entities in relation to that uh, interest rate. That's a simplification from IFRS 16. So public benefit entities are able to choose to replace the borrowing rate, the obtainable borrowing rate, with the rate of interest that otherwise might be obtainable on their deposits held with financial institutions when initially recognising um, a lease. So I guess that's a welcome uh, simplification. So in terms of the impact on your uh, statement of financial activities of the change in lease accounting, what you'll find there is that the, the, the lease charge, the rental charge that would normally go through your accounts in relation to a, 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 an operating lease is replaced with the amortisation of the right of use asset and an interest expense uh, on the, 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 the lease liability. So although the total effect on your results for the duration of the lease is the same, uh, the, the accounting change changes the timing of the expense. Uh, so it, it becomes a lot more front loaded with a higher total expense recognised in the first third of the lease and a lower comparative expense uh, in the final third. And as I mentioned before, it is expected that this change could be very onerous, particularly for um, small uh, small charitable companies that must apply FRS um, 102, whereas we've mentioned already that similar size companies that aren't uh, charities would be exempt from um, applying um, from applying this requirement because they are able to apply FRS 105, which doesn't require uh, th this change in, in, in lease accounting. So I guess if you are a charity with a substantial retail footprint, this is something uh, that could impact you quite, uh, quite, quite significantly. So just moving on then, uh, I mentioned some um, uh, proposed exemptions. So there are exemptions for assets uh, with short lives, so less than 12 months, and also uh, low value assets um, as well. So in terms of the, the value, this low, low value aspect, it's the value of the asset at the start of the lease that, that you consider. And the assessment is performed on an absolute basis. So leases of low value assets qualify for the accounting treatment, regardless of whether those leases are material to the lessee. And the value of lease payments has no bearing on the assessment of whether an underlying asset is of low value. So an underlying asset can be of low value uh, in two circumstances. So firstly, the lessee uh, needs to be able to benefit from the use of the underlying asset on its own or together with other resources that are readily available to the lessee. And secondly, the underlying asset is not highly dependent on or highly interrelated with 
other assets. So clear to see that there might be some judgment required uh, in terms of whether any of your leased assets would fall under the, the, um, the, the proposed exemption. So that is something that you would need to consider uh, with your, uh, your, your um, advisor uh, if you think you're going to fall uh, within some of these exemptions. So that's something you should probably have a look at. So in terms of uh, some key considerations then for uh, for charities coming from the, the lease accounting changes, we do think there might be some, some difficulties, some challenges uh, for charities in relation to how FRED 82 um, is drafted at the moment. But hopefully uh, FRS 102, when it comes out, does take into account some of these um, some of these comments because these have been made in a number of the responses. Um, to the FRED. So first up, um, the interest rate that's used to discount the lease liability. Uh, the FRED at the moment does actually lack guidance uh, on how this might work in terms of how much work a charity would need to undertake um, on the uh, interest rate implicit in the lease or the incremental borrowing rate before it's then able to apply that simplification that I mentioned in terms of being permitted to use the deposit rate. So there's a bit of guidance uh, needed there. Uh, you know, it's unclear whether the, the, the rate applicable on deposits is expected to be the default rate um, applied by charities um, where you're not able to identify the rate implicit in the lease. So that needs uh, clarified. Uh, then the remainder of the points really focus on leases at below, uh, uh, at below market rent, which obviously as charitable organisations, um, you know, that the, the, there are there is quite a lot of that. So we do see that being quite a challenging area in, an, in, in a, number of, uh, a number of parts. So the FRED 82, as it stands, it's paragraph 20.36, uh, 20 does require uh, public benefit entities to account for the difference between the lease payments and the market rent as a contribution to the cost of the right of use asset. So effectively, they're saying that it's got a non-exchange uh, element. It can be akin, I guess, if you think about the donated facilities requirements uh, that we have at the moment. Um, with an FRS 102 in the SORP. So what that does mean is that if you do have any leases at below market rent, then you will be required to establish uh, what the market rent is for those leases in order to account uh, for them in line with, uh, with the requirements. And I guess what we see is that there might be some practical difficulties in applying this requirement, perhaps probably more for um, smaller charities who maybe don't have um, a, you know, a, a, a capable finance director or a skilled, uh, you know, finance person to be able to do this. It might be that you need to employ uh, an external valuer or involve uh, other professionals in helping you um, establish a market rent. So there is that aspect, but I think there are some particular challenges as well where establishing the market rent is going to be uh, difficult. Um, for example, there are going to be, you know, some of you on the webinar who uh, maybe um, rent a, a, an asset this is classed as a heritage asset so there's going to be no comparable properties in relation to that asset or it might be that you are renting a building that's surplus to the lesser uh, requirements perhaps it's a local authority etc so we see some challenges in actually identifying uh, you know or measuring if you like what the the fair value what the market value is um, of some of these uh, some of these leases in terms of the practicability of, of measurement as well, so um, FRED 82 is a bit inconsistent on this, I guess, at the moment. So it's clear that, you know, if when you're seeking to measure a non-exchange transaction, which I've mentioned that this is, uh, and therefore includes uh, leases at below market rent, that in some cases, uh, it might be impracticable to estimate the value with sufficient reliability. Uh, however, I think it might be quite difficult for public benefit entities to actually judge when in, it is or is not impracticable. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, we've got the um, this uh, in saying that you don't have to do this in one, one section of it. However, there's another section of the FRED in the, the public benefit entity section uh, 34, um, which actually has been added in and seems to create a rebuttable presumption that 
that there are certain resources that can be measured reliably and it actually lists accommodation, uh, office accommodation um, as part of this. So effectively, one part of the standard says you should be able to measure this reli reliably and another part of the standard says that you might have a get out and I think there's just some clarity uh, required around that. In terms of establishing the existence of a non-exchange transaction, that could potentially be uh, a challenge as well for charities. So, you know, I do know of circumstances where uh, charities that have a, a, a lease where you're, you're paying a peppercorn rent, um, you know, the, the lessor is definitely, you know, donating an asset to you by giving you that at a peppercorn rent. So you are definitely in receipt of a non-exchange transaction in that circumstance. However, there are other examples that we've seen where, yes, the rent might be below the market rent, but actually that is reflective of the of the circumstances or of the state of the of, of, of the property. So in that instance, you would argue that the rent, although low and, and below market value, um, is actually representative of what the fair value is of that of that uh, of that lease. So we can see that there might be some uh, guidance needed uh, and, or, or some similar materials in terms of you know supporting public benefit entities in the application of deciding whether something is a non-exchange transaction or not. In terms of where you would show this income, the thread's not clear at the moment. How you would how you would recognise it, where you would show it. Obviously, we would expect that it would be shown as deferred income at the commencement of the lease uh, and then obviously released over the life of the, 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 the right of use asset. However, uh, the thread just doesn't cover this. So again, that's an area uh, that does need, need clarified. And finally, the thread does also uh, potentially create another inconsistency between what we see as being two similar property transactions or property related transactions rather with a non-exchange element. So I mentioned before, we've got uh, donated facilities, which in, can include donated assets. Uh, and then obviously we've got this new requirement in terms of the, 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 the leases at below market rent. And it is important that the accounting for those is kept separate. However, uh, in terms of uh, the requirements of section um, 34 in relation to non-exchange transactions, we can see that there could be um, two different measurement bases required um, at the moment per the thread. So section 34 says that donated facilities or assets uh, should be shown at value to the entity, uh, which can but might not necessarily be market value. Um, so therefore, you could have a scenario where you identify two similar non-exchange property transactions at different values, i.e. value to the entity uh, or um, market value in terms of the, 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 the lease at below market rent. So obviously, those should be treated consistently. And I think that the thread needs updated or rather FS 102 needs to needs to be updated to cover that. So that's quite a lot on leases. Uh, in terms of, I guess, what um, we, we await to see whether the Financial Reporting Council, uh, you know, takes into account some of these challenges, challenges and inconsistencies, they have been uh, covered off in a lot of the, um, the responses to the consultation. So that remains to be seen as to whether they deal with that. And also the hope obviously is, is that uh, some of the concessions that we would like to see from applying lease accounting for smaller charities are brought into the new FRS 102 as well. But it is pretty much uh, watch this space um, in relation to that. In terms of the impact on uh, your financial statements, um, you do need to think about, um, so I'm missing a slide there, my apologies, uh, but all I was going to say there is impact on financial statements in relation to, obviously some of the numbers are going to be changing if you are needing to apply lease accounting. So you need to think about how you uh, how you or funders or external parties uh, kind of um, you know monitor or measure the charity and whether there's going to be impact. Uh, there and if you are a charity that has debt and has any covenants then obviously you will need to uh, consider those as well and whether there is any impact because remember I told you that there will be changes coming through um, the statement um, of uh, financial activities so that's definitely something to bear in mind um, and then perhaps an unintended consequence but there obviously is a possibility that we could see some charities uh, being pushed over the audit threshold um, because your total assets would increase Increase um, as well, your, your your gross assets would increase. So there is possibly an unintended consequence there um, as well. And finally, there are a lot of disclosures uh, in relation to lease accounting. So it's definitely worth looking at those uh, if you do think this is something that will um, that will apply to you. 
So moving on to, to revenue then, uh, the slide on the screen there. So Freddie 82 does impose uh, the introduction of a five-step model um, for revenue recognition uh, in FRS 102. So the model will be based on the requirements of IFRS 15, uh, but with simplic simplifications uh, aimed at ensuring that the requirements are cost-effective uh, to apply. So thankfully, moving on to the next slides, uh, there aren't, um, you know, as many changes for charities coming through from from, from this element of the change uh, in, in FRS 102. Obviously, you do have, uh, as charitable organisations, a, a lot of different income streams. Um, and whether you or the charities that you work with are impacted will obviously be determined by, uh, by those income streams. Uh, but for example, if you look at um, donations and other kind of fundraising or a voluntary type income, it's obviously freely given and it's not generally recognised until it's, uh, until it's received because obviously the condition of entitlement uh, is not considered to exist until the money's change hands and so this source of income is unlikely to be impacted by the changes uh, to, uh, to revenue in terms of that five-step model. Um, it does have, uh, you know, it could impact, I guess, more in terms of grant incomes, probably the key area where it could possibly impact because uh, if you're a charity with grant income, uh, that's a uh, class is kind of you know, the contract type income that has performance related conditions attached to them, then I guess that is definitely an area um, where the income recognition could change. But it's worth pointing out that what the SORP will do is interpret these requirements for the sector. Um, so hopefully there'll be guidance within the SORP in relation to, um, to these changes. So less of an impact uh, than leases, but it is still something um, that you uh, that you need to consider. Okay, so moving on to the charity SORP development process. Uh, so this section of the webinar is just looking to give you an update in relation to um, to where we are um, with the SORP. So the next edition of the SORP will obviously reflect the uh, FRS 102 changes that we've just gone through because it has to, uh, but also the SORP development process has been established to consider any other changes that we, we see fit um, to, the, to the charity SORP. Um, as well. So just a bit of a reminder then in terms of where we've been uh, and, and where we are. So um, obviously it's the Financial Reporting Council, it's a requirement that the SORP's updated when a, a standard is updated. So as mentioned before, there will be changes to the, the revenue side of things and also the leasing as well. But we've put in place this year a bit of a different um, review process in terms of the, the statement of, of, of recommended practice. It's called the Charities uh, SORP Development Process, which in addition to considering the changes to FRS 102, um, does also consider um, any other changes as well. So the process is currently ongoing. It actually began back in uh, 2020. Uh, and the intention, I guess, uh, for the SORP was for it to be applicable in 2025 at the same point as FRS 102. But obviously with the delay there, the SORP will follow that. So uh, again, it's a possibility that we might have the SORP uh, later down the line um, than we might have liked or might have, might have anticipated uh, in line with FRS 102. So I've just put on here the development process. I'm not planning to go through that. I really just wanted to highlight here that the key change from the development process was really the involvement of the engagement strands. And I think that was a really welcome and important change. Um, it, really, that was the, the point where the aim was to try and draw in views and ideas on improving the SORP early on in the process with a wide range of stakeholders. So that element um, really is the new uh, section to the development uh, process. And I think it's added a lot of value uh, to the process this year, having been involved in, in, in one of the engagement strands. In terms of the drafting aims, uh, so the ultimately the drafting aims are to try and simplify the report and accounts of charities and, and mainly um, small charities. So uh, trying to take a think small first approach and trying to make sure that accounts are as easy as possible to, to prepare and also to read and, and, and use and making sure that they give readers the information um, that they want. So there's a, uh, just to highlight an international project also ongoing uh, at the moment. So the guidance arising from this is largely expected to be based on IFRS for SMEs and it's the IFR for NPO uh, project. So basically it's looking at a new international not-for-profit piece of guidance, uh, basically, and it's been developed by SIPFA. Um, it was initially thought that this might impact the SORP timetable, um, but the timetable for this 
uh, is unlikely to fit with the sort because um, they're quite uh, a bit away from finalising finalising a document. They just put out an exposure draft with the comments required uh, by March 2024. Um, so um, that doesn't currently fit. But really uh, worth you know highlighting that this exists and that it's ongoing and it might be something uh, obviously that that falls into a future a future sort um, as well. Really just highlighting that that's there. In terms of the drafting principles then for the SORP, so again, I'm not going to go through the, there's quite a lot on this slide. It's really just to give you a flavour for what uh, the SORP making body, the SORP committee were were thinking about uh, in terms of, you know, when they're drafting um, the SORP. And it really is linking into, you know, the issues we know that small charities have in relation to, uh, you know, complying with the requirements of the SORP. Uh, because, of course, you know, a larger charity is one with income over £500,000, uh, which means you have to fully comply with the SORP. So um, we are aware that, you know, the impact of that uh, in terms of the time it takes to undertake, you know, those reports and prepare the narrative is quite difficult. And it does result in a lack of consistency in trustees reports, a lack of quality at times, and some what we would call boilerplate or standard disclosure. So I guess it's trying to move away from that and ultimately, uh, you know, help preparers of financial statements and, and users of financial statements to um, prepare and, and, and understand those accounts. In terms of the development process, again, this is really just for information. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide in any great detail. We've been through the entire process and we're obviously at the, uh, at the, drafting, uh, the drafting stage. Which takes me on nicely to the next slide, which is just looking at the, the, the current uh, status. So the SOP committee <clears throat> has reached conclusions on the 15 priority topics that were identified from the work that the engagement strands undertook. Um, and there are two outstanding conclusions um, from those, and that's in relation to impact reporting um, and sustainability reporting. I do know from chatting to some of the committee members that they are, have actually found it quite difficult to come to a consensus on uh, what the SORP should require and what the, sh the SORP should contain in relation to impact reporting and also sustainability reporting. So they have agreed to come back to these areas uh, later in the process uh, and decide how to update module one of the SORP in relation to the, uh, the, the, the narrative report. So at present, the, uh, the, the, the SORP drafting has started, um, but obviously the committee is limited to how far they can progress that until we have the final edition of FRS 102. Um, it is worth noting at this point that the um, SORP microsite on the, the internet does already contain the detailed conclusions that they've all come to on the priority areas, so you can read further detail on that. Um, if you uh, so wish, and also we're expecting the minutes of all the meetings of the SORP committee to be going up on the microsite um, in due course. And so again, you'll be able to see some of the deliberations that the committee are having or have been having while they've been drafting um, the new edition the, uh, of the SORP. So in terms of what we do know, there's a couple of key areas just to touch on uh, quickly then in terms of tiering uh, and also comparatives. So tiering was an overarching consideration uh, for the, 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 the SORP committee. You know, as we've mentioned before, charities uh, preparing true and fair accounts don't have uh, access to the same concessions that similar sized corporate entities have. And it does lead to the accounts being overly long um, and, uh, and, and complex. And sometimes, you know, charities, small charities, don't necessarily have the expertise uh, to be able to uh, deliver uh, good good quality accounts. So it was a key consideration and still is a key consideration uh, for the SORP committee. However, there's only so much that the SORP can do in terms of uh, concessions uh, in relation to size. Uh, and that's where the tiering comes in because we need FRS 102 to also offer some size-based concessions. SORP can only offer concessions from SORP only requirements. And as you'll know, there are a lot of requirements that come obviously from FRS 102. So we needed uh, FRS 102 to be updated for that. However, uh, unfortunately, we do know that FRED 82 did not contain 
um, any concessions for uh, for smaller charities. So, uh, unfortunately, they didn't uh, take into account all the comments they received on uh, tiering within within A4S 102. So, any new concessions uh, in the sort for smaller charities are not going to come um, from from A4S 102, unless, of course, we've got the the, the lease concessions, which we we await to uh, await to hear about. In terms of the comparative side of things, so again, this was a key area. You will all know in terms of being um, auditors, independent examiners, preparers of accounts, that the comparative requirements in, in uh, charity accounts do make them overly long and uh, long and complex. So we were looking for some concessions to uh, applying uh, comparatives, uh, the requirements from FRS 102. However, again, not been addressed by Fred 82. So unfortunately, the, the bearer of bad news here uh, is that the comparative requirements in your accounts uh, will remain, uh, that are, remain as they are. In terms of the priority topics, so I have got quite a few slides here in relation uh, to the priority topics. Um, I mean, I guess the st overall stance in looking at each of these in terms of determining whether or not uh, there needed to be any changes to the sort was, you know, if the change is justified, then the sort will change. However, if there is not a case made to the current approach being changed, then it will be left unchanged. Um, so I have summarised, as I've mentioned before, what might change on the next few slides and we'll touch on uh, a few of those. But I think the overarching point really to note, uh, and again, you would see this from the, the detailed conclusions on the priority topics that are on the, the sort microsite, is that actually the majority of the suggestions uh, in relation to these topics uh, relate to providing additional explanation, additional advice, additional guidance, either within or out with the SORP. There are no uh, actual, uh, you know, real changes in terms of uh, recognition and, 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 and measurement um, to, 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 to these areas. So um, I guess the stance of the committee has always been to think about, you know, how they can help preparers and users apply the SORP, read accounts. And so really, this is reflective of the fact that what they've been trying to do is look at improvements and explaining things better uh, in the SORP and providing um, support. So in terms of the tiering aspect, it is still worth noting that where the SORP can, some of the requirements will be tiered. Um, so um, watch this space for um, for some of that. So hopefully there's some requirements that do help um, smaller charities uh, in terms of pre preparing their accounts. Uh, but again, we're waiting on the, 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 the SORP to actually see what they're going to propose uh, in relation to that. So in terms of the priority topics, there is a lot on the next few slides. I could do another webinar uh, fully on uh, the priority topics, so I'm not going to go through these in any detail um, at all. I'm probably going to leave most of it for you to just have a look through um, in your own time uh, and, and, and come back to um, as, as you wish. Um, if I was going to pull you know, any key points out, so I guess in relation to reserves, it's just looking at more guidance looking at bringing flowcharts in to help people uh, understand the requirements. None of the requirements are going to change in relation to reserves. Uh, they want to link reserves into going concern specifically as well and have a mandatory requirement that all numbers noted in the trustees annual report are supported in the notes as well. So again, it's just guidance and improving the understanding there um, as well. The committee didn't like the idea of summary financial information, so that's not um, being taken forward. Uh, in terms of the sofa layout, there will be no changes to the sofa layout, although there were some suggested. Uh, however, they are looking to provide more guidance on natural classifications. Um, so that is uh, almost a concession that a lot of charities aren't aware um, uh, exists. So they will be putting more information in relation to uh, using natural classifications for your statement of financial activities than is already in the SORP as well and providing more guidance in that area. Uh, the next three priority areas, I guess, uh, overall, they are looking to remove some of the requirements in relation to notes for smaller charities, uh, although obviously you'll be aware that decision useful information can't be removed 
um, from the notes. Um, and legacies, it's really about no changes there. It's about tighter drafting and guidance to remove uh, ambiguity and inconsistency. And again, a flow chart was uh, is being suggested there, particularly in relation to post balance sheet event notifications in relation uh, to legacies. In relation to uh, donated goods and services, I would just like to highlight on, on this page that there were quite a lot of changes uh, requested to this in terms of uh, the statement of recommended practice coming from the engagement strands. You can see what some of the changes were on the page there. Um, none of these changes uh, are going to happen because FRS 102 uh, has actually um, changed the way that they've presented the requirements here, such that previously the guidance was included within an appendix um, uh, within section 34, uh, and they've now brought those uh, requirements out to be clearer. So uh, FRS 102 has not changed that accounting, which means that the accounting can't change uh, within the SORP um, as well. So no changes to income recognition. Uh, and then we've spoken about uh, impact reporting uh, and on, going on to the next slide as well, the kind of sustainability uh, side of things um, as well. That will be looked at later on um, in the SORP, uh, the SORP process. So in relation to um, funds notes, support costs, expenditure classification, uh, really it's just about uh, trying to provide uh, more information on how uh, charities apply uh, these elements. Uh, so you can see there that no change coming through there. Trying to suggest, uh, you know, I guess, educate between good and bad costs when it comes to expenditure classification. There was a lot of suggestion about removing uh, support costs. I'm not sure whether that will come through um, or not, um, but that remains to be seen. And then we've mentioned the activity analysis uh, in terms of providing um, illustrative examples for the natural classification, which we think would be helpful. Uh, and again, for sustainability reporting, we're really waiting to find out what the, uh, the wider landscape for that looks at before the SORP committee will uh, suggest what SORP should cover off in terms of sustainability reporting. I don't think doing nothing is an option. There will definitely be something in there about it, whether or not they mandate it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but it definitely will be uh, tiering requirements will come into play here in terms of the requirements uh, for small, medium and, 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 and large charities. So really just waiting to see, uh, you know, what those changes are that, that come through there. Moving on then, we've got some other topical financial reporting updates. So the key one here is looking at um, defined benefit uh, pensions. So it was identified from uh, by a number of parties uh, through the review of FRS uh, 102, of, of FRED 82 rather, uh, that there are some gaps actually uh, in terms of uh, how our employer accounts for defined benefit um, pensions. We've listed out the gaps that were identified uh, there and the one I'm going to focus on uh, today is just in relation to the defined benefit asset uh, accounting. Uh, so for the other areas, really what we're seeing there is that uh, there needs to be more guidance within uh, FRS 102 in relation to when uh, a defined benefit accounting uh, ceases to be appropriate. So that may be when an employer exits the scheme, which FRS 102 is currently silent on. And we know that there have been a, more exits in recent times uh, because of the performance of pension schemes. Uh, and so we think that's something that needs to be covered off. Uh, and also where uh, the requirement for either a liability or a contingent liability in relation to where defined benefit accounting information is not available and there's no deficit uh, recovery plan or a cessation debt agreed. So more guidance in relation to what should happen there. And also disclosure of third party guarantees by charities uh, as well. That happens a lot in the charity sector, but there's no requirement to disclose these guarantees, which can, of course, have an, a, an impact on going concern side of things. So we think that should be covered off in FRS 102 um, as well. So these were all raised um, in consultation responses to the FRED. However, the FRC have not addressed these issues. Uh, they could, however, be dealt, by the SORP, uh, dealt with by the SORP. Uh, so that will be something, I guess, that the SORP uh, committee will need to consider going forward. So specifically then in relation to the assets, and this is a, quite a complex area, if I'm being absolutely honest. So I guess in the current climate, we are seeing um, more uh, assets within uh, defined benefit uh, pension schemes. And the accounting requirements, it's fair to say, within FRS 102, 
uh, aren't overly expansive. Um, and so what I personally find myself doing uh, as, a, as a charity auditor is uh, having to uh, look to other places uh, for guidance in terms of how you account um, for defined benefit uh, pension assets. So in particular, IES 19, which is the uh, international auditing standard, and also IFRIC 14, um, which looks at um, defined benefit assets uh, as, as useful guidance. But really what it's highlighted is that IFRS 102 doesn't contain uh, really enough guidance, uh, you know, in this area. And I guess that creates uh, for charities and for charity advisors, auditors, independent examiners, a risk that you get this wrong in terms of the accounting for defined benefit assets. So FRS 102 does cover off when you should recognise um, an asset. Uh, and it explains that you can only recognise an asset whether there's, whether there's either a right to reduced uh, contributions or a right to a refund uh, from the scheme. But it's the judgment and the interpretation of that that's the difficult, uh, the difficult part. Um, and the key is that the right has to be unconditional. Um, and so the scheme rules is where you need to go um, to find out or to determine uh, whether or not, firstly, any of these rights exist, and if they do exist, um, whether that right is unconditional. Um, so in terms of a right to a refund, we have tended to find when we are doing our reviews uh, on the clients that we deal with, that the rules do generally cover um, right to refunds uh, in terms of cessation uh, liabilities. There is sometimes a question over whether that right is unconditional or not, so it definitely is a judgmental area. And I guess the key is that if there are any conditions that might prevent the charity from getting a refund, then there's no unconditional rights. Uh, and we have heard about some complex uh, sets of rules and pension schemes where legal advice has needed to be sought in this area as well, so do just bear that in mind. In terms of the right to reduce contributions, again, it's the scheme rules that you would need to look, look to um, to determine that. Um, what we've tend to find to, to found uh, is that if the scheme's set up such that future contributions can be reduced depending on the position of the scheme, then it certainly may be possible uh, to be recognising an asset in terms of having that right to reduced contributions. Again, if you have a defined benefit pension scheme, it's definitely something uh, that you need to be uh, looking at and discussing uh, discussing with your advisor. Once you've established whether or not there's a right uh, to reduce contributions or a refund, uh, the next complex area is how to value um, the uh, to value that. And there are different valuation bases in terms in terms of whether you have a right to a refund or a right to reduce contributions. And FRS 102, IAS 19 and IFRIC 14 do help um, uh, establish how you should be doing that. Ultimately, uh, if you have a right to reduce contributions, you probably need to get your actuary to do an additional calculation uh, in relation to that. Uh, and that's in relation to the expected future service cost. Uh, that's not something that you can generally calculate um, yourself. So do just bear that in mind in terms of your planning um, and going forward. And if you have um, a right to a refund, uh, you generally find that that might be in line with the uh, accounting valuation. But there is a rule in FRS 102 that the defined benefit pension assets recognise that the lower of the accounting valuation and the recoverable amount. So there is a comparison that needs to be done if you do have a right to a refund and a right to reduce contributions. So you can very quickly see that this is a really complex area and I would just urge you to pick that up um, with your uh, finance professionals, uh, auditors, independent examiners, um, etc. In terms of the legislation uh, side of things, so you will be aware, hopefully, that the uh, Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Act 2023 did receive royal assent on the 9th of August. And I guess the key point here is that the accounts for um, all charities will be published on the OSCAR website and will not be uh, redacted. Uh, we know that the Act is expected to commence in two stages, in both 2024 and 2025, but we don't have specific details in relation to the commencement orders, which will set out exactly when the different provisions uh, are to take effect. Uh, so I guess it's knowing uh, that your information is, is going to be um, on the website and not redacted as it currently is. I think that's a really key point in terms of your trustee information, etc. There will still be disclosed exemptions on the grounds of safety and uh, security. However, there is a new application process 
uh, in relation to that. And so there is likely to be, if that's something you you um, you take uh, account of just now, there is likely to be more formality around obtaining that disclosure exemption. So do just bear that in mind in terms of the um, the new uh, application uh, process. And I guess just quickly looking forward then in relation to the legislation update, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the current review has been pretty limited in scope. So there are many within the sector that do hold the view that additional uh, scrutiny uh, is required. And while, while there are no plans to introduce another charities bill until the next parliamentary term, Scottish Government is committed to actually commencing a wider review during the current term. So there are definitely some changes that we think um, should be taken into account. I guess the key one here is really the audit threshold, which you'll know at the moment sits at uh, 500k, which is uh, low. Uh, it's low in comparison to our counterparts uh, in England and Wales, which uh, the, the limit is, uh, is a million. And and it's low compared to private entities as well, uh, whereby the audit threshold for income is 10.2 million. So I guess that differential does add challenges uh, for charities, uh, particularly in terms of uh, auditor availability, which we'll come on to talk about um, just now. So um, we do think there's place for the uh, the regime to be updated in terms of external um, external scrutiny. I mean, ultimately, we think that the impact here could be on uh, the reputation, you know, um, of charities in terms of if charities are unable to file audited uh, financial statements in time, that obviously that creates concern about uh, reputation. And ICAS has raised the availability of auditors linked to the audit threshold issue as a concern with OSCAR, uh, with the Scottish Government and also with Scottish Parliament in terms of its evidence on the New Charities, uh, the New Charities Act that we've just mentioned. Moving on to auditing standards. So changes in auditing standards do mean that auditors are having to continue to evolve the way that they approach audit engagements. And so just going to spend a few minutes or so touching on some recent developments, but also uh, looking at how charities are impacted by that and then finishing uh, finishing on uh, looking at how you can undertake or tips to undertake a successful uh, tendering exercise. So I've listed some new auditing standards over the last uh, a couple of years, um, I guess. So quite a lot on there. I'm not going to go through um, go through them all. Uh, so really, just going to firstly touch on the going concern uh, side of things. So uh, this was a change actually that came about a couple of years ago now uh, in relation to um, going concern. It was actually at the same time as the pandemic, but it did increase the responsibilities of auditors. There was a specific paragraph being brought in in the audit report in relation to this. So um, as you can imagine, it does mean that auditors uh, are doing more work or, or more robust work in relation to this in terms of making sure that they document uh, you know their considerations of going concern but also assessing whether a materiality uh, a material uncertainty exists uh, so there's definitely a um, more detailed challenge around that and also considering potential downsides uh, downside so that does create um, you know more work for charities in terms of making sure uh, that you are considering the potential downsides uh, and your uh, budgets and forecasts, uh, making sure that you uh, are happy with the assumptions that underlie uh, your, your, your budgets and forecasts and making sure that overall those are more robust. One of the things that I see quite a lot uh, since this standard came in, uh, because obviously it is management's responsibility for going concern, is that I'm seeing quite a few of my charities preparing board papers, kind of at the planning stage of the audit, if you like, and presenting those to their board to show them that they have fully considered going concern and the auditors can then use that uh, paper while they are doing their review as well. And it gives you know certain comfort that management have uh, you know undertaken their responsibilities in relation to uh, in relation to going concern. Uh, and the key point, obviously, is uh, considering the disclosure, particularly if you have a material uncertainty. So it's really important that you uh, think about that up front and think about the disclosures that would be in your financial statements up front um, as well. 
In terms of laws and regulations, again, this is another change that impacted the audit report, and there is a substantial amount of additional work that's required around laws and regulations uh, by auditors. So not only do we uh, have to discuss how you comply, we have to evidence how you comply as well. So there is a, a fair bit of extra work for, um, for auditors in relation to this. Um, it's important as a charity in terms of when you got audited that you're prepared uh, for this. So uh, there will be more detailed discussions or there should be more detailed discussions uh, at the planning stage in relation to this. It's important that we understand how you comply, who's responsible for complying, so making those people available uh, at the planning stage and being prepared, uh, you know, in terms of how do you make sure you comply and what evidence do you have and presenting that to the auditor will definitely help with the efficiency of uh, the, audit, um, the audit of this area. And then finally, in relation to the auditing standards, ISA 315, which has been the biggest change to auditing standards uh, in recent times. So uh, the revisions here, as you can see, uh, the first bullet I've put there is more work. I mean, fundamentally, that's what it means. It's uh, more work uh, at the planning stage, at the risk assessment stage for auditors. Uh, all audit firms have been required to revisit how they conduct their risk assessments. Uh, and, and there is a more detailed evaluation in line with five new inherent risk characteristics and a new spectrum of risk as well, which classifies risks differently. Uh, so previously, we used to have significant and non-significant in the spectrum of risk pulls that out a bit such that some areas of the audit may be classed as more significant than others uh, than, than, than previously. And ultimately, what that means is that there could be increased work in the audit in terms of increased sample sizes if the change in that risk assessment in relation to a particular area is required. There's also more required on IT general controls uh, and control relevant to the audit as well. So more, again, at the planning stage, understanding the systems and the controls around IT. So again, making your IT people available, being proactive uh, and summarising, you know, how uh, your, your general controls work in relation to the IT uh, general controls. You'll also see a change in your audit plan in terms of changes in categories of risk. Uh, and unfortunately, all of this results in increased audit fees as well. So if you've not seen that happen already, then you should see that coming through uh, in your audit fees uh, this year. Uh, availability of charity auditor auditors, uh, just to finish, uh, as you might have found it or probably have found it difficult if you've conducted a tendering exercise recently to find an auditor. It's definitely more challenging in these recent times and particularly so uh, for uh, charities. So I'm just trying to touch on the next few slides, the reasons for this, and then perhaps providing some suggestions uh, in relation to how you might conduct uh, a successful tendering exercise. So there are lots of reasons as to why we're in the situation that we're in, in terms of auditor availability. Uh, audit reform is definitely to blame uh, for part of this in terms of, uh, this was where there were some reviews done in relation to corporate collapses. And this has resulted in the big four firms pushing down a lot of their audits, uh, which then means that the, the smaller firms or the medium firms that tend to deal with not-for-profit organisations are a lot busier with bigger pieces of uh, work that do, unfortunately, recover at better rates than not-for-profit work, which we'll touch on in a second. So um, there is a recruitment crisis in auditing as well. It's never been so difficult to recruit staff such that there is a shortage of auditing staff. And this means that auditors do really need to think about what audits they use their staff on, uh, given that there is scarce uh, availability. Um, specific charity sector issues, I guess, is to do with, as we've mentioned before, the audit threshold. It definitely adds to the challenges in relation to the fact that there are lots of charities that need an audit because over 500 cases is not a, a very high limit. We do also need auditors in the sector to have experience uh, in auditing charities. Uh, and I think the, we have seen some firms move out of the charity sector, which means that the pool is obviously smaller. And I think the constant drive by charitable organisations to reduce costs over many years, and that includes the audit fee and the independent examiner's fee, has not helped, whereby um, price is often seen um, over quality, which actually has driven a number of auditors uh, out, out of the sector in terms of, uh, you know, the recovery that they make on charity audits. So there are definitely a number of issues at play there 
in terms of the availability of auditors. So it's never been more important if you do need to tender uh, that you are uh, undertaking a successful tender exercise. And really the key here is to plan well in advance. My staff planner at RSM is booked for almost a year and a half in advance. That means that if you come to me asking me to do your audit for next year, the answer will be no because we don't have the staff to do it and we wouldn't t uh, tender for an audit if we didn't have the staff. So planning really well in advance, even a couple of years, uh, would be beneficial. You need to make sure there are no barriers as well. So that quality price ratio really does come into it, whereby there should be a, 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 a real change there. So we're seeing a lot more 80% um, quality, 20% price coming through um, as well. You need to make the process as simple as possible. Um, so if you are using public contracts, etc., thinking about making it um, as simple as possible in terms of the form filling and the time it takes auditors to uh, carry out uh, a tender and prepare a document. And I would always recommend that you have an interview or a presentation um, as part of that process as well, because being quite honest with you, that puts charity auditors off tendering if they don't get to get in front of you um, and make their case. I certainly know that that's the case for us. I would engage with a lot of firms and do that proactively, perhaps consider firms that don't have charity experience or firms that are making their way into the sector or are new to the sector. I think that's going to be really important. And also engaging your board and your audit committee as early as possible, getting buy-in on the price aspect uh, and also the planning well in advance uh, and the simple process aspect um, as well. So hopefully a few tips there. Uh, and that's me finished. A real canter through there. Um, happy to take um, any questions. Thank you, uh, Kelly. Very comprehensive uh, presentation there. Um, we are actually almost uh, out of time. Um, I think we've had just a couple of questions through um, in the chat. Um, what we're proposing just based on the time is we'll probably just um, answer them as part of the um, uh, documentation with the webinar um, in, in terms of that. So um, we'll just move forward as we are um, on that basis. Okay. So um, in terms of what's coming up, um, in terms of other uh, future webinars, we've got a listing there, um, 19th and 20th September, the ICAS Insolvency and Restructuring Conference, um, sponsored by Sweeney Kincaid. Then on the 26th of September, uh, an interview with Professor Ian Robertson on how confidence works and the, the new science of self-belief. Uh, and then the 28th of September, uh, Will Farnell uh, talking from know your client to uh, really know your client and how to build a scalable accounting firm. Um, also a couple of events, uh, in-person events. Um, on the 27th of uh, September, newly qualified networking event um, at the Edrington office in Glasgow. Uh, and then the 25th of October, uh, the similar one in Edinburgh, um, which is being held at the Glen Eagles uh, townhouse. Um, links to sign up to all the ICAST webinars are at icast.com forward slash events. Um, so it only leaves me once again to thank you, I think, on, on behalf of all of you. Um, to thank Kelly um, for uh, the comprehensive nature of our presentation covering all those topics um, and of course uh, all of you the audience uh, for dialing in uh, and joining the webinar today. Uh, we do hope that it's been helpful to you. Um, obviously, there'll be more news to come as uh, elements of FRS, uh, FRED 102 uh, and subsequently the SORP um, is, is finalised. So we would be great to receive your feedback um, on the webinar and to hear any future topics uh, that you would like us to cover. Thank you again for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>